A while ago I did a review of a budget action camera called the SJ4000 and both the video and the camera turned out to be quite a hit. The manufacturers have brought out a new model with Wi-Fi on it recently. Now mine hasn't arrived yet, it's on its way to me from China, but I will be doing a review of that one. But in the meantime, I'm looking at this model. Now, this particular eBay seller is claiming that this is the SJ4000 with Wi-Fi. I know it isn't, but you've just got to watch what you're buying because this isn't a fake and it's not a copy. It's just a different product that's being missold. This camera is actually the AT200. So the silver one on the right is the SJ4000. The AT200 is the blue one on the left. As you can see, they're not the same camera. It's not like a clone pretending to be uh, the SJ4000. The buttons are in a different place. The uh, lens on the front looks different. Uh, there's a similar kind of idea, of course, and they both look like a certain action camera. Uh, and there it is. But maybe that's just because that's what the public demands. I mean, the idea of having a box with a lens on the front is nothing new, but it's just the shape of the thing. I mean, if you look at the different cameras at the moment from uh, manufacturers, they all tend to look the same if you get a DSLR. People expect a camera to look a certain way. They don't have to look this way anymore, but if you try and do something different, people just don't buy it. Now, I think that's why people are bringing out action cameras that look like the GoPro, because if you bring them out in other shapes, they don't tend to be as popular. I actually prefer the Sony action camera, but that's definitely not as popular as the GoPro. Anyway, let's look at this AT200 camera in its own right and see if it's actually worth buying anyway, even if somebody has missold it to me pretending it's an SJ4000. If you look at the back of it, those are the specs there. Basically, it's just a little Wi-Fi action camera that shoots in 1080p. It's got a wrist remote control in the pack there as well that works on RF. That is the camera, of course. Uh, we'll look at that in more detail. That's the wrist remote with two buttons on it. Here's all the stuff inside the box. It's the usual selection of mounts and leads and things. Nothing unusual. We'll just skip past it. One thing I want to show you, though, first off, look in the manual here. Note it says mount method. The mount accessories are the same as GoPro. So let's try that out. I've got an official GoPro mount on the left here. Let's push the camera into there and as you can see it clicks in place and fits nicely so yes they are the same now we've got three buttons across the front here I think that lens on the front is glass it's hard to tell with these things unless you break them but it definitely feels like glass the clip on the side there looks quite substantial and uh, let's just open that up so it's one of those things that opens up from the front and the back pops open like that as you can see around the back we've got a seal there to stop water getting in two rubber bits to hold against the camera to stop it rattling around let's take the camera out of the case and have a look at that in a bit more detail not much going on on that side there on the bottom we do have a tripod screw hole mount always welcome one of those uh, these aren't labeled but one of them is an hdmi and one is a usb and there's where your micro sd card goes into it three buttons across the top power mode and start stop a screen with a little led on the corner and that's pretty much your lot now if you want to get the battery out it's a bit weird this so you pull the front face plate off uh, it took me a while to figure this out. You, and I'm concerned, actually, that it's going to snap off this. I mean, look at those little uh, bits that hold there. Oh, by the way, it switched on while I was doing that. So I want to mention something about that in a minute. But there's the battery pack inside. So let's just pull that out. Now, it says on this battery pack that it is for GoPro. Now, I haven't uh, tested this because I haven't got a GoPro to put it in. But it did give me two hours worth of recording time. That was at 1080p 30. Now, the thing I mentioned about the buttons, um, it's you just tap it and it comes on. Now, I hate it when cameras do that because you're going to turn them on inside your pocket. And that's what I did quite a lot with this one. Just the lightest tap and it comes on. And it doesn't auto turn off either. Now, notice it's upside down here. That's because I've had it on before inside my car. I was doing some car clips with it and I put it on a tripod mount upside down. Had it inverted. So let's turn the invert off. And now we've got it the right way up. Now it's going to be a little bit hard showing you on this tiny screen. So I'll plug it into the telly with the HDMI lead and I'll show you on that what the different menus are. So you've got two across the top here. You've got the setup one on the right and then you've got the camera mode one on the left. We'll just go down this. I'll go through it pretty quickly. There's nothing unusual in here. Movie, you've got 1080p 30, 720p 30 and 720p 60. I'll demonstrate all those different modes in the video as I go along. There'll be some footage later on. 
video quality. Now, I just left this in super fine. It sounds like a pimp, doesn't it? Super fine. But I left it in that mode anyway. Seamless, you've got off 1, 3, 5. That's if you want the video to loop around, you put it in 1, 3, or 5. If you don't want it to loop, put it in off. It records files of 4 gigabytes until the card is full and then just stops. Obviously, your battery's going to run out probably before that happens. White balance, now I left all these things in automatic, uh, white balance I left in auto and exposure I left at zero. I don't mess with these in cameras, yeah, I mean you could, you could play around try and find the perfect one but I just leave things in auto to see what the camera can do on its own. Motion detection, I'm not messing around with that, it's always a complete waste of time and it will be in this camera as well. Now you can have a date stamp on the screen or you can have date and time or you can have no stamp on the screen, those are your choices there. So that was that one, quickly go down these, sounds, I've got beeps on in these menus as you might have better hear, you can turn that on or off you can even alter the volume of the beep and then you can have it record uh, your voice or not as the case may be power save this is how long before the screen goes off not before the camera goes off the camera will never go off once it's switched on unless you turn it off date and time that's where you set it language i'll just show you what different languages there are on here there's just these two pages worth so that's your language selection and then stabiliser, you think, oh great, it's got stabiliser. It's much the same as the SJ4000 in this aspect. It's, I'm pretty sure it's just for the photos only because it made no difference whatsoever for video. Notice this is the general setup menu on the right, not the one for the video mode. Invert, I showed you that before. I had the uh, camera upside down, the menus upside down so that you can put the camera upside down and still operate it, although you have to press the buttons in a weird way. Time zones, now it doesn't have GPS, so don't think it's for that. This is probably, if you're just traveling, you, you only want to set the time once and you just move your time zone up and down. It saves you resetting the time all the time. That, you can use it as a memory uh, sort of reader um, or use it as a webcam. That's to pair it up with a remote control, which it already is paired, so you don't need to bother about that one. Wi-Fi, that's where you turn the Wi-Fi on if you want to uh, connect via Wi-Fi, and that's where you set your Wi-Fi password, which is one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, automatically. Format, firmware update, and system, system info, that's the firmware on my camera that I'm testing here. Now, I've just popped into the photo menu just to show you what you've got here. Look, 10 megapixel photos. It doesn't take 10 megapixel photos. It's talking nonsense. Drive mode. Uh, you can have a two-second countdown, a 10-second countdown, or I think it's like a 10-second, and it takes a double photo. It's not an interval recorder. It just does it once, so you can't use it for time-lapse. And that's how many frames per second you can take in the burst mode. Right, let's look at some sample clips. Right, we'll start off in a couple of my usual locations. So here I am in Manchester's Arndale Centre. This is a 1080p 30 image. It gives you an idea of the field of view and the quality of the video. It looks okay. Now 720p 30 taken on the same spot. We've got the same field of view and the image quality also looks pretty decent. 720p 60 really crops in towards the centre of the image. It presumably can't maintain a full 60 frames a second using the full frame. Now if we zoom in on some of those early ones, 1080p 30 on that bit of text in the middle, you can see the quality there where it says the centre of your city. Now let's look at 720p 30, a little bit softer, but not much. There's not much difference between the two, but they're both pretty decent. 720p 60, but strangely enough, looks to be the best of the lot as far as that test goes. Now, in this low light environment of the print works in 1080p 30 mode, I'm getting a really good quality image. It's a little bit smeary. You're always going to get that in a low light environment, but we're pulling through all the detail. We can see everything. There's very little grain and all the colors are coming through as well, which is something that can't be said for a lot of cameras that I bring into here. Now this camera arrived just a day or so before I was due to go off on holiday on a cruise ship touring various places around Northern Europe, so I decided to take it with me. So you've got a few more interesting shots to look at than the usual ones of Manchester. First off, I thought this was an interesting display of sunglasses, but it also highlights a bit of an issue with the camera that it does tend to oversaturate colours, a little bit too bright in places. Now, I wouldn't normally show you this kind of a shot, not very interesting, just buying my lunch off this market stall. But the reason I want to show you is because the camera doesn't cope very well when I move it around. I was getting some change out of my pocket or something, and when I move the camera, it really doesn't like being wobbled, as you can see there. Uh, it doesn't set, cope with movement well at all, as it doesn't when I'm crossing this road here. Just the slightest little movement tends to wobble the image. Uh, that's CMOS wobble. 
uh, jello effect not the kind of camera obviously that you should be going shopping with going into an angry bird store not sure how long this thing's going to be around for might as well film it while it's here but an action camera obviously you're supposed to be attaching it to a helmet or a bike or something and doing a lot of movement with it so a camera an action camera that can't cope well with movement that's going to be a bit of an issue now the next thing i want to show you that's a bit of a problem First off, I'm going to have to demonstrate this with my uh, Sony camera. Uh, I took a proper camera along with me and I want to show you what the sound quality is like through a proper camera and then I'll switch over and show you the sound from the AT200. So just have a listen. Okay, I think that's quite enough of that, and I really did reduce the volume there quite significantly to save your ears a little bit. Now, notice I've cut these chaps' heads off a bit, which is a bit of a mistake, and that's because the field of view wasn't as wide as I was expecting for an action camera. More about that later on. The colours, though, a bit hyper-real, as I mentioned earlier on. I mean, it was a nice day, but I don't think I've ever seen sky that's that blue, and also the uh, colour of that white building's a little bit off-white. It's a bit yellowy at the back as well, isn't it? Now, I just want to show you more about that slow sensor. So this tram is coming past now. And if I do a freeze frame on it, you'll see that the verticals aren't straight lines, they're diagonal. And that is an effect that you get with a CMOS sensor as it tra uh, tracks from the top to the bottom. Slow sensors tend to create more of a diagonal, which shows this is a pretty slow sensor or a slow processor or something. I'm not entirely sure how it all works, but trust me, not particularly brilliant. I'm on a coach here. Uh, pointing it out of the window and as you can see every time it goes over the slightest bump we're getting quite a bit of that CMOS wobble again on there so even though I'm holding it as steady as I possibly can it's not doing a particularly good job and remember it's an action camera so you're not supposed to be holding these things steady you're supposed to be jumping about like a lunatic while strapping them to your head let me just go back to the field of view for a second. So I showed you at the beginning that 1080p30 is quite a bit wider than 720p60. This is 1080p30 that you're looking at now. Buildings are a bit crazily coloured, but they were quite bright, but maybe not that much. And this is 720p60. Notice the colours are different as well. But main thing is, notice how much of that building we can see. I've got to go up and down to get it all in shot. So there's quite a lot of difference between the two. The 720p60 does have a proper 60 frames a second, but the uh, field of view is just much too small to be useful. However, notice that um, mast on the right-hand side. It curves in slightly at the top, but not crazily. So the lens on this one isn't particularly fisheye, which is something that a lot of people don't like on some of the other action cameras where everything bulges in and when you do a pan like I'm doing now some of those other ones create a weird kind of uh, like you're looking inside a ball looking out everything's curving around you whereas this doesn't have that much of that effect so that's one positive thing I suppose but it's also the reason why I cut the heads off those chaps earlier on by mistake because I was expecting them to be in shot and I just pointed it in their direction and they weren't it's a narrower field that I'm used to on an action camera Anyway, there you go, that's the Little Mermaid. Uh, everyone seems to want to take a picture of it, but it isn't that impressive really, is it, after all? I suppose the one positive thing I've got to say about the video quality is the way that the camera copes with light and dark fluctuations like this. It doesn't overwhelm the sensor, it seems to cope quite well. Notice, however, this building's a little bit bleached out at the top because it's just got the brightness right for inside the uh, boat here. But as I pan upwards and go across, it does adjust pretty quickly as it goes under that bridge. That was pretty impressive, really. Although, overall, I'm not that impressed with the performance of the camera. Let's just have a look at some photos. So I'll show you a few different ones. It, it pretends it does 10 megapixels. It doesn't, of course. It just takes uh, frame grabs almost out of the video, as you can see from them. They're not particularly impressive. In fact, they look worse than uh, grabbing a frame out of the video. I'll demonstrate that now with this shot. If we zoom in on that writing again in the middle, notice how it looks worse than it did when I zoomed in on a 1080p 30 video. So photos aren't impressive. Now you can use this camera as a dash cam, of course. If I plug in a powered USB micro lead in the side here, notice it comes on and it automatically starts recording, as you can see at the top there. And if I remove the power from the camera, 
the camera stops recording. So of course you plug that into your lighter socket and it automatically starts and stops when your camera, sorry, when your car is turned on or off. And it does a pretty good job. It's seamless. There's no uh, gap between the clips. I mean, there are different clips, obviously, but if you join them together, there's no frames missing or duplicated. And again, that issue that I mentioned earlier on, uh, the fact it can cope well with light fluctuations like I'm uh, going into here, means that it does actually do a pretty decent job as a dash cam so maybe this sensor is more suited for that purpose now of course at night time as i mentioned it does cope pretty well with low light i mean this is quite impressive really i don't notice too much grain in this image you get smears and things uh, a glare though from lights coming the other way mean that you can't read registration numbers but then again i'm pretty sure you probably couldn't with most cameras and even in darker areas where the lights are a bit more spaced out like this it does a decent job so Maybe this should just be used as a dash cam, but then again, there's a lot of alternatives that you could get if you wanted a decent, cheap dash cam. Now, when it comes to playing back photos and video, there are a few different options you've got. The first one, you can do it on the camera itself using the little screen on the back. You can move between clips and you can play and pause them. And that's it. You can't fast forward or rewind. It's pretty restrictive and it takes quite a while to get to the particular file you want as well. Now you can plug it into a television using the supplied HDMI lead. The ports on the camera are a little bit sunken down and just a bit off center, which means you really have to jam that HDMI lead in there. It might just be mine, but the build quality isn't that brilliant on this camera. I can imagine that uh, damaging something on the circuit board. Now, when you turn it on, the screen is taken over by the television screen and basically the TV just shows what the screen on the back of the camera would show. One thing I should mention, you cannot record and view the HDMI feed at the same time. It's one or the other, but when it's connected up to HDMI, you cannot record on the camera. But the things you can do, you can go through the different files, uh, just like using the back of the camera screen and just Pick a particular file, play it, pause it, that kind of thing. It's very slow moving between photos, so you might want to use the Wi-Fi app instead if you want to pick a particular photo off the camera. Now, you download the app using one of these QR codes. Uh, I'll scan that in with my iPad here, and that uh, takes me to the relevant application in the App Store, which is called iSmartDV. It's free, of course, this application. So I've downloaded and installed that now. To get the Wi-Fi up and running, you've got to go through the menus on the camera, find the Wi-Fi option and turn it on. Then on your device, you've got to connect up to the Wi-Fi hotspot that's been created by the camera. Now, this was a bit flaky for me. It tends to disconnect a lot and wouldn't connect sometimes. But anyway, when I've got it working, this is what you get. You get a live viewfinder and you can record video or photos on this and change uh, some of the settings in the camera as well. You can see it's a live feed there that I'm getting back from the camera. It's quite responsive as a live feed, but again, these things aren't for using it as a remote control aircraft screen or anything. This is just for very short distances, so don't get any crazy ideas. Now, if you want to download those files from the camera, either the photos or the video, go into this menu option here, which takes a little while to pop up. I was a little bit concerned it wasn't working there. As I mentioned, this app is pretty flaky. It tends to crash out, or it did for me, anyway maybe it's uh, better for other people but of course they can always update these things over time so i can't really criticize that too much anyway we go through the screens here as you can see it takes a while to download all the thumbnails you cannot stream a th uh, one of your video clips as you can see there i clicked on it, it says you can't stream you have to download a video clip to see it now if i wanted to download all of them you can see it's going to take quite a while so i'm better off putting it into single file mode Picking a particular one, putting a tick on it, there I could download a few of those if I wanted, but one file will take one minute, it says here. Now it says it's wireless N in the specs. I'm not sure whether it is, but it does seem a little bit quicker to download some of these files than some other applications I've used in the past. Right, so it's downloaded it and it wants access to my uh, photos uh, thingamajig so it can put the photo in the right place on my iPad. It's done that now. So let's go and have a look in the Photos app and we'll play back this particular video. But you're not just restricted to playing it back. Once it's on your device, you can load it up into an editing package or do whatever the heck you want with it. So there are uses for this Wi-Fi transfer, but you just want to keep those clips short because it takes quite a while. One potential selling feature of this camera might be the fact that it comes with this RF remote control wristband inside the box. You can start and stop video recording 
and you can take photos but the camera has to be set into the relevant mode so to take a photo you have to have the camera in the photo mode and then that button works and then to take videos you have to move it into the video mode you can't swap between modes using the wrist strap makes you wonder why they didn't just put one button on that wrist strap and then the only other feature that I'll mention for completeness whilst the camera is recording you can capture stills from the video at the same time by pressing the center menu button right so let me try and sum up what I've learned about this camera in the month or so I've been using it unfortunately it's mostly negative but on the positive side it does have a tripod screw hole which is something I always appreciate on any camera it gives you different mounting options negatives though i don't like the fact you can turn it on just by tapping that button rather than holding it down and that means you end up recording the inside of your trouser pocket a lot or just burning the battery down because it doesn't automatically turn off the construction of the camera is a bit poor in places it doesn't feel like a quality product and i don't like the way you have to take that front cover off to get the battery out that's going to snap at some point definitely one thing i didn't mention the lights on this camera are incredibly bright and cannot be turned off there's a flashing blue one on the front when you're recording which everyone looks at and then the one on the back if you're driving in a car and you've got that in your face it's like following a police car you have to put black tape over both of those if you're going to use the camera I suppose the most important issue though is that this action camera just isn't up to the task of recording any kind of fast moving action due to its very slow wobbly sensor and then of course we've got the issue with the sound recording <laughs> which leaves a heck of a lot to be desired. So I definitely cannot recommend the AT200 camera, and I'd suggest you also try and avoid getting sent this one by any unscrupulous eBay sellers that are trying to palm it off as the SJ4000 with Wi-Fi. Now, as far as that camera goes, I will be reviewing it in a few weeks' time. The manufacturers have been waiting to send me the finished production version because I've been doing a few tweaks to it, so we'll have to see how that fares when I do the review of that one. But I'm imagining it's going to be quite a lot better than the AT200. Anyway, for the moment, as always... Thanks for watching.